so good to see you. Thank you for being here on this Palm Sunday, and we're going to celebrate that with our kids in just a bit. But it's so uh, exciting to get close to Easter, another week, and we're there. So we want to celebrate this morning with the Hosannas of Palm Sunday. I'm Pastor Vern, one of the pastors on staff here at Encounter Church. So glad you're here. If you are a guest, a request for you, when the service is over, make your way out the rear doors, turn to the right, and there's a welcome center there. And we'd like to introduce you to some people who've got a friendly face, would like to take some information, if you're willing, you don't have to, but a Connect card is there. And so we'd invite you to make connections with us that way and keep informed about the activities and schedules and all the rest of it of the church. You can also submit a prayer request there if you'd like. So we want you to do that if you would please. And then uh, simply understand that uh, we are entering into the spirit of Easter here and to be experiencing God's grace and God's uh, blessing upon us as families, as children. And so that's a part of what we're doing here today. Um, what's next here? I need to follow my script, and I have a way of uh, wandering off script. That's kind of the story of my life. Uh, so they've got a video for you to give the remainder of the announcements, and that's a good thing because I'd mess them up. So watch the video. Good morning, church family. Here are a few announcements for you today. On Sunday, April 16th, in both our 9 and 1045 services, we are going to be having our Baptism Sunday. This is going to be such a cool Sunday because it's going to be kicking off one of our new teaching series, which is going to be There's Something in the Water. If this is the next step that you want to take in your journey with the Lord, then make sure you email office at EncounterChurchOfPalmyra.org. We can't wait to celebrate with you there. We are so excited to gear up for our Holy Week services. We're going to be kicking off with Good Friday on Friday, April 7th at 7 p.m. This will be a time where we remember Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. There will be child care provided, and they will have their own service back in Kids Connection due to the graphic nature of the service. We hope that you will come out and join us for Good Friday service. And then on Easter Sunday, we will be having three services, one at 8, 9.30, and 11 o'clock a.m. We hope that you will come out and join us for Easter Sunday as we celebrate our risen Lord and Savior. We hope to see you there. All right, church family, that's it for the announcements. Now let's stand together and pray into our service. Don't do it. We're, we're going to pull a fast one on you. Uh, we have a special guest with us this morning. This is Kenny from Kenbrook. Probably never heard that before, have you? Okay, Kenny from Kenbrook. He's got an announcement for you and some information that you families especially will find useful. Good morning. Good morning, Kenny. Uh, I am Kenny of Kenbrook Bible Camp. I have a table back in the Kids Connection area, back by the bathrooms. Um, I have information about summer camp. We have summer camp for kids ages 6 to 17. If you have a kid that age, if you have a niece or nephew or grandkid or neighbor that age, come and see me. Uh, if you have anyone that is 18 to about 25 in that same kid, niece, nephew, grandkid, uh, come and see me. We'd like to see them uh, about summer staff. Uh, we also have other opportunities, uh, so there's something for all of you. We have hem sing coming up. We have a Mother's Day buffet coming up. Uh, we also do a dad camp for dads and their kids' ages or in grades first through fifth grade. So if any of those interest you as well, come and see me. I will be there until everyone leaves after service. So love to come talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Kenbrook's such a special place, so take advantage of that. Would you stand with me now, please? We're going to pray. Lord Jesus, we invite you into this place. We thank you for your presence among us. We thank you for the word that is spoken. We thank you for the praise songs that we sing to lift up your name. We pray, oh God, for Pastor Ted this morning, for the worship team here. May all things work together for the good. So we're thankful for this time on this Palm Sunday. Lord, the story from the scripture has us waving palm branches, a symbol of praise and a symbol of worship. So Lord, today, bring our hearts in tune with yours. 
May our worship be acceptable to you, O God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again, church family. It's so wonderful to see you. I just want to take a real, real quick moment to brag on the three lovely ladies to my right, your left. Uh, this, this week, they led worship. They were part of a team that led worship for the young, young people, the uh, junior high work. Um, the junior high gathering, and that was just a beautiful thing for my eyes to see your children worshiping the Lord. I just wanted to brag on them a little bit. Today is Palm Sunday Parade with our little Kids Connections kids, so I'm under no delusions of grandeur. You're not going to be paying much attention to us on this one. Here we go. Uh, they're going to be coming out. Lift your hands with us and, and celebrate their entry. Here we go.
clap your hands. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to begin. Your love made a way to let mercy come in. When death was arrested and my life began. was redeemed, only beauty remained. My orphan heart was given a name. My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, Sing it out. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. It's your on a criminal's cross darkness rejoices oh heaven had a lost one week before Easter come on believers come on but then Jesus arose with our freedom in hell yes he did cause that's when death was
celebrate that, church. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. everybody. Good morning. It is wonderful to be with you this morning. Palm Sunday is just a, a traditional day to celebrate and to praise, and we are going to do exactly that. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. It is so good to have you here. I, I encourage you, if, if we haven't had the chance to meet, maybe it's your second time or whatever it is, please come say hi. I would love, honestly, I would love to get to know you and get to meet you and shake your hand. Uh, so I normally sit over here. I'll be out in the lobby as well, but just come say hi to me. That makes me happy. But just to bring you up to date on where we're at in the series, we are in the final week of our series, Praising Through Pain. The point of this series is there are 15 psalms, 120 to 134, that are called the Psalms or the Songs of Ascent. These would be the psalms that would be recited by the ancient Israelites on their three journeys to Jerusalem every year. And Jerusalem's on a mountain, and so it's the Psalms of Ascent, because they're walking up this mountain towards Jerusalem. And these psalms cover all different types of, of feelings, emotions, thoughts, life experiences, whatever it might be. And today, we are coming to the very last psalm, Psalm Psalm 134, a psalm that is focused on blessings and praise. Before we go any further, though, I need to correct myself from something I said last week. I told you that Psalm 131 was the shortest psalm. It's not. <laughs> Psalm 134 is, and I didn't actually realize this until I started studying Psalm 134, and I was like, man, these are close. I actually counted the words, sure enough. Psalm 134 is, wrong, is, in fact, the shortest one. So if any of you got that wrong in a trivia question last week, I apologize. I led you astray. But this is a beautiful psalm. It is such a, a wonderful psalm, but it's incredibly short. But here we go. We're going to dive into this anyway. This is the pinnacle moment, the whole reason for this journey in the first place. The travelers have been making their way to Jerusalem, and now they have arrived. And they have been walking for weeks, or, or, or I mean days, weeks, I mean possibly even longer. And they're here, Jerusalem, the temple, the presence of the Lord. This is why they came, to worship and to praise God. Now, I picked this passage for two main reasons this morning, and I kind of already talked about both of them, but just to make it clear, uh, I think it makes sense to finish out this series with the final psalm. So that's part of why I chose Psalm 134. But then the second reason is, again, because this is a Sunday of praise, of worship, uh, and it's fascinating, and we'll get into this, the similarities between Psalm 134 and the triumphal entry, the, the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, which is what uh, Palm Sunday is really all about. Um, but before we get into all of this, what I would like to do is to accurately define blessings and praise. What are they? Because so often what happens, in, in English at least, is we use these terms, but we don't really have a good definition. If someone asked you to define it, you would kind of like stumble around it a little bit. We just kind of work in generalities. And so I want to bring clarity to this. What exactly are we talking about when we talk about praise and when we talk about blessings? Well, Eugene Peterson talks about it this way in his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. This is what he says. Listen carefully because you it's very circular, but just follow with me. I'll, I'll talk slowly. Because God blesses us, we then bless him. We are simply responding with what we have already received. Blessing God has this idea of offering praise, offering gratitude, offering thanks for the blessings that we've already received. I'm going to say this another way. To bless God means offering praise and gratitude 
to God for the blessings we've received from him. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, good. I'm glad you're with me here. We'll try to clarify this a little bit more. Uh, let me give two brief examples of this just to help really lodge us into your brains. One of these is a personal example from my life. One of them is an example from Scripture. So the personal example here first. My wife Heather and I uh, have been married now for almost exactly 11 and a half years. And it was a wonderful day. I can remember it still quite well, but there is one thing from this day that has really stuck out in my mind so clearly, and it was an interaction between Heather and her dad after the wedding celebration was over. You see, what happened is we got married at a small church in Lancaster, and then we had our reception at the Eden Resort, also right there in Lancaster. If you're familiar with it, that's where we got married. Um, but we had our send-off after the reception. We got in our car, we drove away, and it was very romantic. <laughs> but we just drove around for a little bit because we were coming back to the Eden for that night. So we didn't actually go anywhere. <laughs> but we ended up coming back to the Eden then that night, and what happened is we pulled up to the front, and for whatever reason, Heather's dad was standing outside the doors. And he was just doing something. I don't remember what he was doing, but that's not really the point. All of a sudden, Heather turns to me, and she said something real quickly to me. And I, had, I was like, what? I have no idea what you just said. She opens a door, and she runs to her dad, and she gives him just the biggest hug. And I'm just sitting there being like, I have no idea what just happened. This is, this is strange to me. But eventually, she comes back, and she gets in the car. And I asked, I was like, what was that about? And this is what she said. She said, I just needed to say thank you. I needed to say thank you for everything. <laughs> you see, I'll never forget this moment. Because this was, frankly, a wonderful way for us to start our marriage. Watching my wife run over and offer gratitude to her dad for the blessings that he had given her to get her to this point throughout the course of her lifetime. You know, this is just a beautiful example to me about praise, about thanks, about gratitude, about our posture towards God. Obviously, that was towards her dad, but it's a really good example for us in understanding what praise is. Now, here's the second example that we're going to get into. This comes from Luke chapter 17. You don't need to open there. I mean, you can if you want, but uh, Luke chapter 17 and uh, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but I want you to just pay attention to this theme of praise because it's all throughout this passage. And what we're told is that Jesus is continuing on toward Jerusalem. Now, Jesus had been in Jerusalem before, but this time was different. There, this wasn't just any old trip to Jerusalem. His time had now come. He knew in this journey, when he got there, he would be crucified. And now he's on his way to Jerusalem. And while he is heading that direction, he enters a village where ten men with leprosy stood outside at a distance, and they called out to Jesus. And this is what they said. They said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. Starting in verse 14, this is what happens next. And then Jesus looked at them, and he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed of their leprosy. But Scripture tells us only one of them, when he saw that he was healed, came back to Jesus, shouting, praise God. And he fell to his knees on the ground at Jesus' feet, thanking him for what he had just done. And Scripture tells us something really interesting. The next verse is, this man was a Samaritan. This is interesting. We could talk about this for a long time. We're not going to get into it this morning. But Jesus asked, didn't I heal ten men? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give glory to God except for this foreigner? Hmm. And Jesus said to the man, stand up and go. Your faith has saved you. Again, there's a lot that could be said from this passage. We could literally spend the entire morning talking about this. But what I want you to see is this beautiful imagery of praise. This man, so moved by the grace that Jesus had just shown him, turned around and came back. You see, all ten of these men's lives had just been drastically altered. For someone that had leprosy, they were outcasts. They had to live outside the city, but now they were no longer required outcasts. They no longer had to live outside town. They were no longer unclean. They had a life again. They had hope again. But only one of them returns to Jesus. 
And when he gets close, he can't stop himself from shouting praises for what God had done to him. For the blessings that God had given him, he now offers praise. Now this is both appropriate and important. Because notice Jesus' questions. He says, only you? No one else returned to give God glory? (laughs) Now Jesus doesn't expand on this, but the implications are that these other nine men didn't really have a true interest in Jesus. They simply wanted him to heal them. And once they received what they wanted, while they were off doing their own thing, only one man had appropriately returned to praise God for what he had done. Again, we can learn a lot from this passage, but for this morning, just take notice of the importance of praise. Because this is the question that we want to answer more fully this morning using Psalm 134 as our launching point. How important, really, is it for us to praise God? So this is what we're going to do, just to give you guys clarity so you know what to expect. We're going to read through Psalm 134 twice, again, because it's so short. Then we're going to ask our most important question, and then we're going to break this psalm down into three parts and apply it to our lives. Does that sound good? Okay, here we go then. Psalm 134, feel free to turn there if you want. If you have your Bibles or turn on your phones, the words are on the screen as well, but sometimes opening your actual Bible, there's something, something about that that's a really good thing to do. But here we go, Psalm 134, 1 to 3. This is what it says. It says, Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord, who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion. He who made heaven and earth. One more time. We're going to read this again. I told you, it's short. Come, bless the Lord. All you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord, lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Now that's all the further that we're going to go in our passage. And I said this last week, but psalms can be really, really challenging because they're so short and we're just like, what in the world is this actually talking about? Well, we're going to get into that. But first we need to ask our most important question. And you know this question unless you're here for the first time today and then you don't know this question. (laughs) That's okay. You're going to find out. And I have a feeling that today is going to be really, really good. So don't let me down on this one. So on the count of three, we're going to ask the question that Pastor Lon Solomon used to ask me every single week. And it's such an important question. So here we go. On the count of three, yell it out loud. One, two, three. So, (laughs) So, (laughs) and it was good. That's exactly right. Thank you guys for obliging me in this. You make me so happy. But you say, Ted, so what? You know, this this passage is short, and I'm not sure it answers our question. How important, really, is praise to God? Well, let's see what we can learn. Like I already mentioned, Psalm 134 is the final psalm. It is the pinnacle moment of this traveler's journeys. They have arrived in Jerusalem with the express purpose of worshiping God, celebrating these festivals for what the Lord has done for them. We have to remember, all of these festivals are in remembrance of what God has done. So it's blessings and praise. We see this give and take, even through, it's baked into the cake of these festivals. And the psalm starts off by saying this, Come, bless the Lord, all you servants of the Lord who stand by night in the house of the Lord. Now, in ancient Israel, we have to understand that this servants of the Lord is in reference to the Levitical priests, meaning the priests from the tribe of Levi. There were 12 tribes. Levi was one of them. These are the priests in this tribe, and they are serving in the temple. This is their responsibility. But this verse specifically says something interesting. It says those who stand by night, implying that even during the night, They are supposed to bless the Lord. Now, Scripture expands upon this in other places, and here's a really good example of that. 1 Chronicles 9.33 tells us this. It says the musicians, all prominent Levites, lived at the temple, and they were exempt from other responsibilities since they were on duty at all hours. Some translations say they were on duty both day and night. Meaning... The temple was never left without a group of priests to tend it and to offer praise within it. 
Now, this is really interesting, if you ask me, especially in light of our question, how important is praise? Well, it's a group of people whose goal is specifically to make sure that the temple is taken care of, but also to ensure that praise never stops. As a side note, Revelation 4, verse 8, we see something very similar happening. The Apostle John says this. He says, And around the throne, meaning the throne of God, on each side of the throne were four living creatures, and day and night they never ceased to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Day and night, night and day, praise never ceasing. Now this is how this applies to our lives today. This is our first point. Praise is extremely important. You see, the presence of the Lord resided in the temple, specifically in the Holy of Holies. And the Levites were the ones who attended to all the sacrifices and all the temple worship there. However, after Jesus' death, the, the curtain that separated the temple from the holiest place was ripped apart. It, it, was pre it prevented people from entering into God's presence directly. And this is significant because now this means all of us, everyone who places their faith in Jesus, can come before him. 1 Peter 2, 5 tells us that everyone who believes in Jesus are now a holy priesthood. We don't have to go anywhere. We don't have to do anything specific. We can and should offer praise to God anytime and anywhere. But it's really interesting to note that this call to continual praise still remains. We see this all over the New Testament. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18 says this, Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful or praise him for what he has done in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Or Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Hebrews 13, 15, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. Friends, we say all the time that we are saved by faith through grace in, in Jesus Christ. Reverse that. Re saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. But it's not about our works. That's the point. So that none of us can boast. And this is extremely true. But if we truly believe that Jesus is our Lord and Savior and that he has taken the punishment that we deserve, then we must live this belief out. And this includes many things, but Scripture is extremely clear that one of them is that our lives should be lived with constant praise on our lips for the things that he has done. An attitude of praise, a posture of praise. Now, this isn't just singing all the time. Oftentimes, we'd be like, does that mean we have to sing all the time? No, <laughs> that's not what it means. Say thank you. That's more in alignment with this. How do we do this constantly? We remember the things that God has given us. It's an idea that no matter what we're doing, we can praise God in it. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says it like this. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So we can praise God doing something as mundane as washing the dishes or writing papers, changing diapers. <laughs> we can praise God while we're driving or while we're eating lunch. It doesn't matter. We're just here to cultivate an attitude of thankfulness and an attitude of praise for all the good things that he has done for us. Now, that's the first part, so we're going to jump into the second part here. This verse next says, Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. Now, this is honestly just a pretty basic command. Lift up your hands to the holy place. Well, what's the holy place? Well, we're talking about the holy of holy here. This is where God's presence resides. Lift up your hands to where God is and praise him. Now, this command, it isn't unique by any stretch to this particular passage. We see this over and over again in Scripture. King David, for example, in Psalm 28 says this. He says, Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. Notice the similar terminology. Psalm 68, 4, So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. But how does this apply to us then? What do we learn from this? Well, I think what this helps us to remember is that praise is a choice. You see, this series is called Praising Through Pain. Friends, when we're in pain, praise is not an easy thing to do. Here's the reality. 
we will not always feel like praising God. I certainly don't. And depending on the situation, I may not be able to command my heart to praise God, but I can command my arms. As Eugene Peterson says, again, in his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, he says, lift your arms in blessing, and it just may be that your heart will get the message and be lifted up also in praise. (laughs) Isn't this a pretty good definition of any discipline, though? You may not feel like doing it, but it's still the right thing to do. Frankly, I think Nike hit the nail on the head. (laughs) Just do it. Even when you don't feel like it, just do it. But here's the other thing. Lifting up our hands isn't only to help us when we don't feel like praising. It has other benefits as well. For example, it's a sign of surrender. It's a posture of humility. It communicates both our desire for and our dependence upon the Lord. Think of it like this. I have a four-year-old daughter, and it's very common for her to run up to me, and she'll just throw her arms into the air when she gets to me. Now, when she does this, she doesn't often say anything in association with it, but she doesn't have to, because in this one simple action of raising her arms, she lets me know exactly what's on her heart and what's on her mind. Daddy, I want to be close to you. Please hold me. I think this is a universal sign for all children, frankly. But here's the point. When she lifts her hands for me, she couldn't care less what other people think of her (laughs) because she isn't raising her arms for them. She's doing it for me. Well, this is the same kind of reason why we lift our hands and worship to the Lord because it's a posture of praise. This is an intentional decision on our part. We can command our arms even if our hearts don't feel like it. And this communicates love, trust, and faith in him. Friends, we don't do this for anyone else. This is for the Lord because we love him. And I encourage you, if you haven't done this, or maybe this is a brand new concept for you, try it. Here's how I would encourage you to start. Try it at home, by yourself, during your prayer time. Simply sit there, raise your hands, palms up before the Lord while you pray. This one simple posture places us into a position to hear from God and to be able to praise him for what he's done. This is an extremely helpful posture. And Psalm 134 talks about this. Now that's the second part. Here's the third and final part of the psalm, and it ends with this. It says, May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. I think it's beautiful that the psalm ends not with us praising God, but with him focusing back on us. Him blessing us. You see, he is the one and only true God, and there is no one apart from him. This psalm reminds us that it was he who created the heavens and the earth. It is he who created us and everything in it. And it is he who now blesses us. Ray Fowler, in his work on Psalm 134, says this about God's blessings towards us. He says, here's the difference. When we bless God, we kneel or we bow down before him. And when God blesses us, He reaches down to take care of us and our needs. We bless God by praising him for what he has done. God blesses us by loving us and providing for us. Practically, God continues to watch over us. He continues to bless us and provide for us. Not meaning that we're not going to have any struggles in this life. That is not what this is saying. It's also not saying that riches will simply just (laughs) pour down upon us. That's not it either but he does promise that he'll love us and that he'll watch over us. And it's a reminder that he is God, the one and only true God. Amen. And that's Psalm 134, in a nutshell. (laughs) But before we close this morning, I told you I wanted to connect this to Palm Sunday because here's the thing. 2,000-ish years ago, we remember and celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now, here, let me set the stage. Like the other travelers that year, Jesus had just traveled for days, possibly weeks, for miles on his ascent to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, probably recounting these psalms along his path. And on this particular day, he completes the ascent. 
And now that we have a somewhat better idea of Psalm 134, uh, what I would like to do is just simply read this account from Luke's gospel of the triumphal entry, of what it tells us it was like. This is, uh, like I said, Luke's account. This is recorded in all four of the gospels, but I, I like the way that Luke talks about it. And I think it's so interesting to see how the Old Testament and the New Testament align in this, how interconnected Scripture truly is. So here we go. Luke 19, again, the words will be on the screen here, starting with verse 28. So Jesus went on toward Jerusalem. Again, significant. He's going there to die. Walking ahead of his disciples, and he came to the town of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, and he sent two disciples ahead. And he said, go into that village over there, and as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one's ever ridden. Untie it. Bring it here to me. And if anyone asks you, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. And so they went, and they found the colt just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying this colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. And so they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. And as he rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. And when he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all of the wonderful miracles they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Quick side note, Luke doesn't recount this, but Matthew's gospel does. And the people cut branches, and they waved them in the air. As we saw the kids walking in this morning, they shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna. But, continuing in Luke, some of the Pharisees amongst the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like this. But Jesus replied, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Now again, Luke doesn't tell us this. But Mark does. And this is why when we read accounts like this, we can read all the Gospels and say, how do we learn about what actually happened? And this is one of those situations. Because in Mark 11, it, it, it actually tells us what happens when Jesus enters into Jerusalem. Mark 11, 11 tells us, and he entered Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple. And he looked around at everything. But as it was already late in the day, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Now, look at all the similarities between Psalm 134 and the triumphal entry. Here it is. It's the final moments. Jesus entering into Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. That's what Psalm 134 is about. And Jesus' journey into Jerusalem concludes that day with going into the temple. Really interesting, a commentary I read on this passage said that this, pa this psalm was kind of like a call and response in ancient Israel. Uh, the, the, the sojourners, the journey, the party, the caravan that would get to Jerusalem would often get there late in the day. And they would call. They would call out to the priests in the temple, bless the Lord, bless the Lord. And the priests would respond with, and God bless you. It was kind of this like really neat uh, 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 back and forth conversation. But they went to the temple. And this is exactly what we see Jesus doing. And it's late in the day. But notice something here. The continual praise that is supposed to be given in the temple isn't spoken about. Instead, four verses later in Mark, after Jesus went to the temple and looked around, four verses later have him driving everyone out of the temple because of what it had turned into. It was no longer what it was supposed to be. We don't see this praise in the temple talked about. Instead, we see the praise given to Jesus, the Messiah, for what he has done. And it was his followers who were choosing to praise him. Now, I use this word intentionally, choosing to praise, because they did this in spite of the situation. Namely, the powerful religious leaders, the Pharisees, who were watching them, who were clearly upset by this. But they chose to praise him anyway. Now, in this passage, like I said, it doesn't recount the palm branches being waved, but we know that happened from Matthew's gospel. And here's the interesting thing. You can't wave palm branches without lifting your arms. Also, this passage speaks to the critical importance of praise. Jesus said to the Pharisees, if they, meaning the disciples and followers, keep quiet, then the rocks along the road would cry out. You think praise matters to God? 
And to top it off, just as Psalm 134 ends with God's blessing on us, less than a week later, Jesus took care of us and our needs in a way that we never could have. He gave his life. He died for the sins of the world and resurrected again victorious over the grave to give us life eternal through faith in him. It is the greatest blessing that we could ever ask for. Certainly, he continued to bless us. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe, maybe this stuff doesn't do it for you, but this is fascinating for me. How intentionally connected the Old Testament and the New Testament is. And Jesus is at the center of it all. Friends, this is what I want to wrap up with this morning. Here's my challenge. But it's not just for this morning. Really, this is a challenge for life. Let's choose to live a life of praise. Because it is a choice. We may not feel it, but God is worthy. And it's important. Scripture makes that so clear. This is something that I am constantly reminding myself of too. As we learned about last week, all of our lives we need constant maintenance in our relationship with Jesus. And this is just another example of that encouragement, another example of that reminder. Choose to praise the Lord. Sometimes this is easy and it comes naturally. Other times it's literally the last thing that we might want to do. But lift up our hands in humility and trust in God and in his goodness. Please pray with me. Father, we are so thankful for what you have done for us, the gifts that you have given us. Father, as we remember Palm Sunday, all those years ago, Father, and the connection to Psalm 134 and this call to praise you, Lord, may that be on our hearts and minds, not just this week, but heading into the future. Father, you have blessed us with so many things. If you had only given your life as a sacrifice or ours, that would be so far greater than anything we could ask for. But you continue to watch over us and provide us with what we need. Lord, my prayer is this morning for each and every person who is in here, who is hearing this message, whether you're in here, whether you're online. Father, wherever we came from, wherever our hearts are, I know there are those in here this morning who lost loved ones this week. I know there is sickness going around. I know there is pain. Father, there is you. We give you the honor and the praise for who you are. Let us constantly remember that. In the powerful name of Jesus, we pray all these things. your voice with us. Yeah.
church. Come on. Lift, lift it up. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Yes, you are. Father, we love you. Thank you for this morning and everything that you did in it. Take it out. Take it out to uh, the world. We love you. Amen. To repeat Pastor Ted's challenge, choose, very intentional, choose to live a life of praise. Uh, Psalm 134 has some very physical posturing. Ted used the word posture. You stand in the house of the Lord. You lift up your arms. And then you speak. You use your voice. It's not exactly a posture, but it is a response out of the posture of the presence of God and offering up your praise to him. So choose. Choose to live a life of praise. A couple of things before we go. Good Friday is coming up this week. Friday evening, a service here at 7 o'clock. It's ironic, isn't it, that we call it Good Friday? It was not so good for Jesus, but it's sure good for us. Because of his death, our sins are covered. Our life is secure in him. So please come and make this a part of the celebration of Holy Week and Easter coming Friday at 7 p.m. There are ways to give that we want you to be aware of, and thank you for being so generous and faithful in your giving. There are drop boxes if you came prepared this morning on the way out. But then there's on the screen uh, ways to give electronically or other methods of giving. Please note those, so just want to say thank you. Finally, the prayer banner to my left, to your right. If you came with a heavy heart, with pain, with whatever kind of circumstances that are difficult, or maybe you just want to praise God. There are people over there who are willing to enter into time of prayer with you, so we invite you to do that. Thank you for coming this morning. God bless you. Go in peace. Celebrate the praise of our Savior, Jesus Christ.